Cole has written, uh, a sentence, of course, where he has been so, uh, everyone might describe it as being overcome uh, with the awareness of what God the Father has done and God the Spirit has done and God uh, the Son has done. And we read in verse 13 and 14 something of that work of the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We are going to be reminded uh, this evening by Paul of our salvation and uh, reminding again that it's a case of whoever believes in Jesus is, uh, will have eternal life, will be saved. So by way of introduction, let's, we're going to remind ourselves of uh, our salvation. And uh, we're coming to verses 13 and 14, but I think we need to take it all in context again. So uh, let me throw up here uh, Ephesians 1 and verses not 1 to 14, as on the screen, but 11 to 14, which is actually the verses that we have. And let's just remind ourselves that in verse 11, there's a kind of change of direction that Paul uh, brings into, his, into the, his statements. And he starts highlighting in, uh, in those verses the difference between the believer and for someone who is not yet a believer in Jesus. And uh, we've been seeing some of those differences over the last few Sundays, that first of all, in verse 11, is a case of that we are in him. We are in Jesus. There's a union with the Lord Jesus Christ, a oneness that, if you remember, the Lord Jesus Christ prayed about, prayed for in John 17. And then there's an inheritance that is ours because we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> We're the very children of God and heaven is our home. And then last Sunday, we were thinking of the purpose of the believer in the Lord Jesus, which was to the praise of his glory. And that was uh, verse 12. Now, there are two other differences which I've mentioned in passing over the last couple of Sundays. We find them in verse 13 and verse 14. There's that sealing with the Holy Spirit, verse 13, and there's this guarantee of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit being the guarantee of our inheritance, our eternal uh, inheritance in heaven. But in verse 13, Paul reminds us of our salvation. He writes, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And I think it's worth just stopping there at that moment uh, in that verse 13 and consider uh, again as Paul is uh, bringing it to us, uh, the gospel of our salvation. Well, how does, he, uh, how does he talk about salvation? How does salvation come to us? Uh, of course, we could talk in terms of how God, the Holy Spirit, deals with the soul. But let's uh, as I think we, we are getting here in verse 13, we're getting the sort of, uh, the, if you like, the, the human side of how we come to salvation. And what he says in verse 13 is our first point, that it comes by hearing the gospel, by hearing the gospel. So we'll throw up our verse 13 uh, now. In him you also trusted believing, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, after, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Salvation, eternal life, comes by hearing the word of truth. And of course, the word of truth we would define as being the whole of scripture. Uh, possibly we might say, well, there are certain uh, scriptures uh, in the Bible that more speak more directly to us about the gospel, such as John chapter 3, verse 16, and other verses, John 14, verse 6, for example. 
But this uh, hearing the word of truth can come to us in a number of ways. But I think you, I pray that this may be true of all of us. We will be able to say that the fact that we, there was a point in our life when we, we, we first began, we first realized that we were hearing the word of truth uh, and the means whereby we came to faith is the result of the providences of God. That there were things in our lives, we might even refer to them as sort of stepping stones to where we came to the point of seeing Jesus and him crucified for us, dying in our place. You know, those, what we, what we described some, I think some months ago, maybe even a few years ago now, this just so happened moments from God. It just so happened that you met somebody who spoke about Jesus, who invited you to a church service or something like that. You know, there, there are moments, because we, we can all make this testimony, I, I think, that we might say, well, before I became a Christian, uh, God was evidently at work. And we can acknowledge, especially if we've been walking with the Lord for a good number of years, we can acknowledge that it was all of God's doing and not ourselves. And uh, perhaps you've heard many testimonies of God's people over the years. Of course, I've heard quite a few. But uh, two that I love, I like mentioning them. Uh, so forgive me if you've heard them before. Um, one was a, a during the testimony of a, a, a Russian uh, a minister in, uh, in a conference. And um, he was uh, originally a sailor, a Russian sailor. And he was in, uh, in a merchant vessel. He docked into one of the uh, into uh, one of the ports in the UK, where his ship was unloading the the, the goods. And uh, he ran into somebody who was from the sea mission. And uh, he was warned. This is the days of communism and, and Stalin. He was warned. You know, don't listen to these horrible English people. <laughs> and. Uh, so he refused, but the man thrust the tract into his hand and he put it into his pocket. In, into his pocket. And uh, he, he, his testimony was that many months later, while on board ship, um, and getting trouble, there was trouble in the family, and, and he was sort of feeling miserable. He, he, he searched the pocket of his coat and he found the tract, a Russian tract, obviously, and he read it, and he came to faith in the Lord Jesus. That's God's providence, isn't it? that that man was given that tract, that that tract was placed in his pocket, that in the providence and in the timing of God, he took it up and read it, and it was speaking to his need and revealed Jesus to him. Or oh, there was uh, an occasion when I heard somebody give their testimony that uh, he wasn't interested in God, he wasn't interested in, in Jesus or anything like that, uh, but he was on his way home. Uh, he didn't have a Mac or an umbrella. It poured down in rain, this was a Sunday evening, and he, he went into the local church to avoid the rain, and he was in a foyer, and he was determined he wasn't going to listen to anything. He was just going to stay there until the rain stopped. And he was so intrigued by what the preacher was saying that he moved from the foyer to the back pew. By the time the service had finished, he had become a believer in the Lord Jesus. Those, again, are the providences of God that work, aren't they? And God organizes the means whereby people hear about Jesus. I wonder if that's part of your testimony, yourself, that you know that there were certain providences in, in your life, given of God, whereby you were open to the gospel. You were open to hearing and receiving the gospel. And it wasn't just simply a case of intellectual knowledge, but it was penetrating into your heart. Well, let's ask another question, and this brings us on to our second point, really. How do you hear the Word of God? How do you hear the Word of God? And I want to suggest to you that a number of things, but our second point would be this, and uh, we uh, read about this in Romans 10. It is the Word preached. It is by the preaching of the Word. And... Uh, the word being preached, the word being taught, the word being, well, I better not say shared because I'm going to use that as a second, as another point in a minute, but the word of God coming to you in some way. When a man of God 
brings the word of God to the people of God and gives a faithful explanation of the word of God, then God is at work. And it doesn't have to be a church setting. It doesn't have to be a Sunday evening or a Sunday morning. It can be a coffee morning. It can be a school assembly. It can be an open air service. It can be a nursing home. God can use these places where a man of God will come and share the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans chapter 10 was telling us uh, this in verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And that's a reminder to us, I think, uh, here this evening, that we need to pray about the preaching of the word. Not, ne not, not necessarily just for a Sunday morning service or a Sunday evening service or even a midweek service, but, you know, things like um, food for thought, things like the toddler group, or the opportunity we will have at Easter to give a, a, a message to the, the, young, the younger, well, I'm going to call them young mums, but not so many young mums now. There's a few granddads around as well. But for the adults and the children. And God can use such events uh, for his word to go out and people to hear and to believe. And pray. Pray for, for those who God is raising up and called to be uh, preachers of the gospel, preachers of the word. And uh, we read there in verse 15 of Romans 10, don't we? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? We want, want uh, preachers that are, are called uh, preachers of God. Well, we've said about how do we, um, how, how do, how do we hear the gospel? Well, by the preaching of God's word, the preached word. But there's also the word read. That's our third point, the word read. You see, there are times when we cannot and we're not able to preach the gospel to someone. But possibly, hopefully, prayerfully, we can, exchange, we can um, encourage people to take up the scriptures, uh, to read the word of God for themselves. Perhaps we're able to give a book or two. And sometimes when you've had a discussion about something and, some, and somebody says, well, I don't believe that, uh, or they, they may say, oh, well, I don't, the, Bi you know, uh, the, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, challenge somebody to read the gospel, to read the Bible, uh, to read God's word. Now, I found over the years that sometimes when I tell people, well, you should be reading the Bible, they, they'll say, well, the Bible's a big book. And we, we don't deny that. It is a big book. It's got 66 books in the Bible. And uh, so sometimes people need a bit of guidance in this. And perhaps they can be defeated by being presented by a big Bible. Well, why not give a New Testament with the Gospels and the letters? Or possibly even just a Gospel. Mark's Gospel or John's Gospel. You can get these things and give it to people and challenge them to read for themselves about the Lord Jesus Christ. And pray, that's the important thing. Uh, pray uh, that God would take it and use it for the salvation of that person's soul. There's a story about how the gospel came to Korea. Um, the whole of Korea uh, then, in about 19, uh, well, 1906, actually, they had revival. But the... the um, the, the gospel came to Korea in 1866. And uh, I love the story, so I'm going to tell it to you again. I think I told it to you before, but I think I'd like to tell you again. It's about a man called Robert Germain Thomas, and he was from the South Wales Valleys. And he was a missionary originally with Hudson Taylor uh, in China, but he had a real heart's desire for, for, for Korea and the Korean people. 
And uh, while he was in China, he had met some Koreans and he was beginning to try to learn the language. He had various gospels uh, translated into Korean. He had portions of the scripture. He had a New Testament. And there was an opportunity for him to go into Korea. And I won't give you the whole story. But he was martyred. He was clubbed to death by Koreans. But as they were killing him, he was thrusting into their hands these tracts, these portions of God's word, these, these New Testaments. And after he had died, they discovered, uh, these Koreans who had, uh, had murdered him, they had discovered that he had boxes full of, of, of Christian literature and New Testaments that he was trying to give. He wanted to give to the Korean people. And this is what always, this, you know, this ties in with the idea of the providence of God. Because it, it amazes me. They took these pieces of paper and they put the pieces of paper, you've probably heard this before, they, they, they pasted the pieces of paper on the walls of their homes. They thought it would make good wallpaper. And they covered their walls with the, with the scriptures in the Korean, uh, well, in the Korean script. Well, they did that, but then they did something else. They started reading the scriptures. And as they started reading the scriptures, then they came to faith in the Lord Jesus. If you uh, go uh, to Korea, uh, I meet a Korean uh, Christian, and just mention the word Robert Thomas to them. Uh, he's their great saint, if you like. He's their great hero. Uh, we might know not very much about him in this country, but if you go to Korea, they know all about him because he's the man who brought the true gospel uh, to Korea. And, and we, kn we, we know, don't we, these days, that, uh, that uh, South Korea, you need to pray for North Korea, but South Korea is a great missionary sending country uh, where lots of Koreans are going around the world preaching the gospel and uh, building churches. So when you give a tract, if you're able to give portion of scripture, or if you're able even to give a New Testament, well, cover it all with prayer. I'm sure that Robert Thomas did that. As he was praying to go into Korea, he prayed, didn't he? And surely when he was being clubbed to death, he was also praying for the souls of these Korean people whom he loved and wanted to share the gospel with. And as a result of that, well, the Bible came to Korea in 1906. But um, in um, talking about how we can hear the gospel, how people can hear the gospel, let me give you a fourth one, and that is the word shared. Now, what I mean by that is not just um, you know, talking about the scriptures or giving the scriptures, but speaking about your own experience of the Lord Jesus, sharing your testimony, uh, of how you came to faith, or how God is at work in your life today. A testimony can be a very powerful instrument in the hand of the Holy Spirit. But in saying that, three things. Make sure it's your own testimony. Because I've met uh, students, Christian students, who uh, I suppose they wanted to uh, spice up their testimony, added a few extras, uh, that hopefully, uh, prayerfully, they're trying to give glory to God, but uh, sometimes you see these um, uh, Christian students that I've met who come from middle-class backgrounds, and you think they must, be, they must come from the, the worst parts of Glasgow you've ever been, the, in the way that they were so, so sinful. But they just make sure it's your own testimony. That's the thing, because that's what God uses, the genuine testimony of a servant of God who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. Then, then make sure it's connected with the word of God. Uh, that you can bring in the word of God with your testimony. And make sure when you're giving your testimony that you give the person you're, you're speaking to uh, the, the absolute certainty that this is of God, this is God's doing and not of your decision-making. That you didn't just one day wake up and make a decision for Jesus. 
but rather that God has been working in your heart and perhaps over a great length of time. So you see, when we share our personal uh, dealings with God, you'll find that people will listen. They may argue with you if you're talking about certain parts of the Scripture and certain texts of Scripture, and they may say something like this, oh, that's only your opinion. But when you're giving your personal testimony, your personal experience of how God has been dealing with you and how you've come to faith in the Lord Jesus, then you'll find that people will listen and you'll find that they will accept it. They may say, well, it's all right for you. That's your experience. But they'll accept that as being true because you've said it. But we've been talking about hearing the word of God and how hearing the word of God is the means of salvation that God uses. But let me just, as a fifth point, say this. It's not just by hearing. Let's go back to our text again, Ephesians uh, 1, verse 13, in that first half. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of God, the word of truth, <coughs> the gospel of your salvation. You see, people don't come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ simply by hearing the words of the gospel or simply hearing the words of the Bible uh, being read to them. Uh, it's much more than that, isn't it? It isn't simply a case that these gospel words enter into, into the ear and sort of go into the mind and somebody is wonderfully saved. No, that, that's not how it works. I, I remember years ago, uh, I, I've got a feeling it was Bath, but I may be wrong about this, but years ago there was, there was a man on a, one of these tricycles <laughs> and he had a megaphone and he was going along the main roads uh, shouting out verses of scripture. He wasn't explaining the verses of Scripture. He was just reading out or shouting out verses of Scripture. And I guess he must have thought, well, if I'm going to speak these words of gospel, they're going to do a work in someone's heart and mind. Now, God can do such things, of course. I'm not denying that. Um, but what the Bible tells us, it's not just simply hearing. It's about believing what you hear and trusting in what you hear. It's about believing in Jesus. It's about confessing with your lips as well that Jesus is Lord. And for that, I want us to move uh, to Romans again. Romans 10, verses 8 and 9. And then uh, Paul quoting uh, from the Old Testament. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confessing Christ is very, very important. Over the years, one or two occasions, I've met people who say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I haven't told anybody about it. Well, it, they actually did speak it to me, didn't they? But... Uh, we don't keep Christ to ourselves, do we? Uh, we confess him as our Lord Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. And so uh, hearing uh, the word of God, the word of truth gives us salvation, but we have to believe in it. We have to trust in it. We confess it to be true. We confess Jesus to be Lord. But let's uh, move on uh, to uh, another point and it's this, in verse 13 and verse 14, Paul is giving us, and we can only deal with this briefly uh, this evening, Paul is uh, dealing here with the confirmation of our salvation. Of our salvation. He's talking about assurance. Um, he talked uh, about how we are saved through believing in Christ Jesus and hearing the word of God, hearing the word of truth. But God, the Holy Spirit, does a work in us which confirms that we are belonging to Jesus, that we are in Jesus, that we have an inheritance in heaven, that we are to the praise of his glory. So when a person comes to a, a real genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then God, the Holy Spirit, comes 
and dwells in the believer. So let's read Ephesians 13 and 14, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, in Jesus also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, we can take up this theme a little bit on, an, on another occasion, perhaps, if you want to. But my view about the this, this sealing of the Spirit is this. This is the moment when God the Holy Spirit comes to the believer. And he comes into the believer when that person comes to faith, trusts in Jesus for their salvation. God puts his seal upon the Christian, uh, the new believer, uh, the stamp of his, uh, if you like, ownership, this person is a Christian. He belongs to God. He is uh, in Christ Jesus. And uh, that seal of the Spirit authenticates the oneness that we have and the union that we have with Christ. That in him that Paul has been uh, speaking of uh, all the way through that one Greek sentence from verse um, 3 right through to verse 14. It's, it's part of being a believer, that we have God the Holy Spirit in us. But perhaps we might be posing a question here, and it's this. Why is the Holy Spirit in the believer? Well, verse 14, I think, is telling us, at least it's giving us an answer. There are many answers to that, why God the Holy Spirit is in the believer. And we haven't got time to unpack all that, but we have one answer here that Paul gives us in verse 14. And it's this, he is the guarantee of our inheritance. And so we read in Ephesians 1, verse 14, of God the Holy Spirit, he says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the pur purchased possession, until that time, if you like, uh, when we are taken up into glory, into heaven, to be with God forever, to the praise of his glory, he says. That's the number we said last time. That was one of his favorite phrases here in uh, this particular section. And so the Holy Spirit is given to the believer. And many reasons for that. But one of the reasons is this, is the assurance that we are in Christ, that we belong to God, that our, uh, our inheritance from God is eternal life with him in heaven. Now, I must admit, I was tempted to say, right, another, another 27 points, and we'll, talk, we'll give, you a, give you a sermon on assurance, uh, but we're not going to do that. I don't think we've got the time to really give the subject it's, uh, of assurance its proper due. But let's just remind ourselves again that God the Holy Spirit is in the believer. And one of the great works that God the Holy Spirit does for the believer is to, is to assure us, is to be the guarantee of our inheritance, to, to be speaking uh, to us of the fact that we belong to God. Jesus is our Savior and Lord. And our sins are forgiven we have peace with God, and we have eternal life with God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for these verses that we've been looking at over, uh, through over the weeks. We thank you, Lord, for these last two, verse 13 and verse 14, which speak to us about God the Holy Spirit. And we praise you and thank you that for every true and real believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit is in us. And Lord, we know that there are times in our life and our spiritual experiences when we can know something more uh, and certain from the, uh, of the presence of God the Holy Spirit in us. And there are times, Lord, when uh, not that you are far from us, but we draw away from you and there can come that coldness. But Lord, we pray 
for the work of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. We pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in your church here as well. And uh, Lord, uh, we pray for his help, his assistance, his assurance that we are yours and this is your church. And we ask and pray for his strengthening, his help and blessing upon us as we seek to lift the Lord Jesus Christ high amongst us, as we seek to proclaim him as the Saviour, the Lord, the Redeemer. And we pray for his help and equipping that we might be those who go and tell and share that good news that Jesus saves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.